Shane. And thank you everyone for coming to hear this lecture. I've worked for Hampton Court Palace for 15 years. It's still a thrill and a pleasure every time I go to work. It's the most wonderful place. Um, some of you may have been before. Uh, those who haven't, I hope that my talk may inspire you to come and visit us. So Hampton Court is essentially two palaces in one, the Tudor of Henry VIII and the Baroque of King William of Orange, surrounded by some of the world's most beautiful gardens. But it, it's not just about powerful rulers. There are many more stories connected with Hampton Court in 500 years of royal history. So we're looking here at the first slide, which is just an overview to give you your first glimpse of the palace as you would see it today. But to go back to the beginning, we have to start with Cardinal Wolsey, Henry's chief minister, a man who rose from really humble origins to the dizzy heights of becoming chancellor and very high in the church, becoming a cardinal. It created for him enormous wealth, which tells us something about the importance of church officers at the time. The church could be a marvelous career. So he's, he's very wealthy, he's very successful, he's a very able politician and administrator. And he's able to afford to, to start to build this amazing palace in 1515. When you come up to the West Front, it, this is exactly what you expect to find in a Tudor palace, a multi-storied gatehouse with crenellations. Now, the, um, the crenellations are up here, and that's what makes people think sometimes that it's a castle, because it does look a little bit like a castle, but it definitely isn't. It's a palace. The Wars of the Roses are over, there is peace in England, there's no civil war, there's no need to build castles anymore. And the wealthy, the aristocracy, a great churchman like Wolsey, they're building palaces, they're building venues for pleasure and places to impress. Now Wolsey wants to impress his king because Henry will be coming to visit, but he also wants to impress foreign ambassadors very much. So it, it's important that he should have a, a magnificent palace like this. One thing that you probably or possibly don't realize when you come to Hampton Court is that it was at that time much, much brighter. You, you, you look at it now and you see that rose red brick, which is pleasing to our eyes. Well, that wasn't bright enough for the Tudors. They painted it bright red. They had stained glass. They had golden spires and turrets and colored beasts all over the place. And the whole thing would actually have looked like something from Disneyland. So it would look like a fairy tale palace. And up on the rooftops, you would see all these chimneys all over the roof. We actually have more than 400 chimneys. And the chimneys are saying something quite definite about Wolsey and then later about Henry. They're saying, I'm rich. I can afford to heat this enormous palace built of brick. It's as simple as that. Coming inside the palace, the, the Wolsey closet is really quite important. It's, it's rather small. It's a Victorian reconstruction of what we think um, a small Tudor room would have looked like. And our curators tell us that this is as close as you can get to understanding Henry's private apartments, to knowing how they would have looked. Um, because some of his rooms were small. They were small, intimate rooms, cold closets. So if we take a closer look inside here, here is what we would expect to find, panelling. Now, we call this linen fold panelling, but that's actually a Victorian name. The Tudors called it lignum undulatum, which means wavy lines. And it would have been painted and gilded. Everything very, very bright. If this was the king's closet, it may have carpet on the floor. Look up above here and see a leather mache ceiling. This is all original, dating from Henry's reign. So it's literally made from leather mache, which has been gilded and painted. 
And the wall paintings are by Toto D'Annunziato, an Italian Renaissance artist. It, it's giving us an idea of the astonishing quality of work that is being done in these palaces. It gets its name the Woolsey Closet because it's Woolsey's motto that runs around the wall. But it's actually much closer to, to Henry and to understanding what his apartments would have looked like. Now, Henry takes over Hampton Court in 1529. Um, essentially, by 1527, his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, is described as beyond the ways of women. She's not going to produce another child. And the king is, in any case, very much in love with Anne Boleyn. He's anxious to get, not, not a divorce, an annulment, because he claims he never was really married. Um, Woolsey does his very best, but fails to get that annulment. And he falls from favor, and he loses everything. He would have actually lost his life, but he died on his way to the Tower of London. So Henry takes over Hampton Court. Now, talking about Henry VIII is a whole lecture in itself. Um, he's famous for six marriages, breaking from Rome, the dissolution of the monasteries, and the ruthless elimination of anyone who stood in his way. It's in Henry's reign that the Tower of London gets so much of its bad reputation. And that is indeed where people get sent. N nothing bad happens at Hampton Court. It's always a pleasure palace. There are no dungeons or prisons. It's to the Tower that Henry will send you if he wants to get rid of you. So what is it about this man? Why is he so famous? Apart from the um, points I've already mentioned, he's a larger-than-life personality. He's a big man. He's six foot two. By 1540, he will have a 54-inch waist. He's massive. He's the richest king we ever had. He built more palaces than any other. Hampton Court isn't his only home. He has more than 50 and many of them are just as big and grand as Hampton Court. He's also the most powerful king we ever had, because for the first time, the king is head of both church and state. Previous kings, remember, have had to uh, consider the pope. The pope has been head of the church. Now, Henry's doing away with that. He himself will be the direct line to God, all-powerful. And Hampton Court um, was a palace that he wanted for some time, so he's very pleased to take possession of it. He carries on building and spending great sums at Hampton Court. And they start decorating the palace with the king's beasts. Here are two of them. On the left, you can see the Golden Lion of England, and on the right, that's a, a, a Beaufort Yale for Henry's grandmother, Margaret Beaufort. Both of these beasts are reproductions. None of the originals survive. But at the time, there would have been hundreds of these beasts all over Henry's palaces, all brightly colored. They would be made mainly from English oak, some in stone or terracotta, all very bright. And they're important because this is a time when most people still cannot read. The beasts proclaim the owners of the house. Although, incidentally, the rate of literacy will increase vastly during the Tudor period. In London, in 1500, one in 12 people can read. By the end of the Tudor period, in 1600, one in four will be able to read. The printing press, the, the development of printing, is obviously a factor, but there's another important reason, which you may have already guessed, it's the Bible in English, and this will happen in Henry's reign. Now, he has these animals all over his palaces. He also has emblems and heraldry proclaiming himself and his queen. And remember, he has more than 50 houses. Um, it's going to be a little bit of a problem every time he changes his wife, because they have to keep changing all the emblems and the badges for each, for each queen. And as, as you're well aware, his marital history is, is rather busy. 
Down in the kitchens, uh, we, we still have a great deal of these uh, 16th century kitchens surviving. Very interesting. The, the amount of food that would be prepared here would be on a vast scale because he had a court of 1,200 to feed. It's a bit like being on a crystal ship in that there's just enormous quantities of food of the very highest quality. And you're not expected to eat it all. It's all about proclaiming Henry as a generous and wealthy host and of someone who has very good taste. Everything about this palace comes back to one thing, the self-glorification of the king. Come into the great hall and you're entering his entrance hall. It's very high, 60 feet high, and the sheer height is intended to make you feel small. It has a beautiful carved oak roof. Tapestries line the hall. We'll take a closer look at the tapestries in a minute. Um, but I just want to say that the many functions um, happen in this hall. On a day-to-day -day basis, it's a dining hall. Men sleep on the floor at night. For Henry, it's the first room that a visiting ambassador will see, so it must display his magnificence, which it does. Later, the hall was used as a theatre. Elizabeth I watched Shakespeare and his men perform at the bottom of that hall. Taking a closer look up at the roof, this is all original oak, completed in 1536. We have good records of the men working to complete the roof and of Henry being a difficult employer, being so impatient and imposing tough deadlines. They have to work through the night, it says, through their sleeping and their drinking times by candlelight to try to finish it. And they do finish it by the beginning of May, 1536, and they just put up the badges for Anne Boleyn. And something happens. On the 2nd of May, she's arrested, and by the 19th, she's dead. It happened very fast. Henry even sent for the swordsman from Calais before the verdict was announced of her trial, and he came over to, uh, to cut off her head. What does that mean for all the, the carpenters and masons and craftsmen? It means they've got to get back up there and get those badges down um, on, on Anne Boleyn's fall. The very next day after her execution, he announces his engagement to Jane Seymour. And then they have to go and put Jane's badges up instead. Now, just before we move on, I hope you can see these little heads here on the sides of the roof. These, these are called the eaves of the hammer beam roof, and the little heads here are called eavesdroppers, and that's where the term comes from. And they're, they're, there's an implication that they're listening from the rooftops. They're watching you, actually. They're watching and listening. And court will become a dangerous place, especially later in the rain. I just want to say something quickly about tapestries, because... They're the preeminent art form of the Tudor period. This is what the super rich spent their money on. Beautiful tapestries, so expensive, so luxurious, so special. It's the clearest indication of Henry's wealth. He owned more tapestries than anyone in history, apart from the Pope and Louis XIV. And tapestries don't only indicate Henry's wealth, he can use them to push forward his political agenda because tapestries tell stories. And remember I, I mentioned about the Tudors, you know, not, not everyone could read, so they're very good at visual imagery and storytelling. And these tapestries are the story of Abraham, um, a religious leader, and Henry is now the leader of his people's religion. He's head of the Church of England. Henry also has a son because Jane Seymour gives birth to a boy, Prince Edward. And Abraham had a son in old age. Abraham was actually 99 when, uh, when his son was born. So um, I'm talking about these tapestries because they're very important. And if you do come to Hampton Court, this is one of the highlights. They are the most valuable item in the royal collection after the crown jewels. 
They date from 1540, and they are still hanging in their original location. So if you come to Hampton Court, please uh, make sure you see the tapestries. Coming into the Chapel Royal, we can see some of the, the, the gorgeous colour that you would have found throughout the whole of the Tudor Palace. Henry's Great Hall used to be blue uh, with gold stars, and all that paint uh, peeled off. But the Chapel Royal was restored by the Victorians. Augustus Pugin, God's own architect, was involved in this restoration. It is the finest 16th century ceiling in England, and you can see it today by walking into the Chapel Royal. Henry uh, actually died at Whitehall in 1547, and he was succeeded by each of his children in turn. We're looking at Edward uh, by William Scropes. He's the son by Jane Seymour. Next to him is Mary uh, by Antonus Moore. Henry's daughter by Catherine of Aragon, and finally Elizabeth by Nicholas Hilliard, the, the ermine portrait, the daughter by Anne Boleyn. Uh, Henry's children didn't build any palaces, they didn't have to, their father left them so many. Hampton Court perhaps was not the, the, the greatest favourite with any of them, but they did certainly spend um, a good deal of time there. They would travel around through all the different palaces. The Tudors came to an end in 1603 because none of Henry's children had children of their own. And when Elizabeth died, the crown passes to the Stuarts. So it passes to the son of Mary, Queen of Scots. And we call him James VI and I because he's the sixth of Scotland and the first of England. Um, and it may seem an unusual thing that, you know, that James got the crown because his mother had been executed for treason. He is a foreigner, he's classed as an alien, and under law, an alien cannot inherit the English crown. But James has a lot going for him. Um, he's male, he's Protestant, so he's the right religion. He's an experienced king, he's actually been king since he was an infant, and he's managed to reign over the Scots, which is much harder than actually holding your crown uh, with the English. And he has two sons. He has a ready-made family. So he really ticks a lot of boxes. And in fact, the succession is very smooth. Now, James spends time at Hampton Court. It's a great favourite for the king uh, for hunting. Um, Shakespeare and his men uh, renamed themselves the King's Men and came to Hampton Court to perform for James. And James does something else at Hampton Court. He commissions the King James Bible. He commissioned it in 1604 and it was completed in 1611. It's the most important Bible, uh, sorry, the most important book ever written in English. The language is deliberately archaic. They actually hearkened back to Tyndale and earlier Tudor Bibles with, with the language. Um, but um, be beautifully, uh, beautifully written, and the book had profound impact. It was that book that Abraham Lincoln kept on his desk, the King James Bible. So later Stuarts ha actually had more of an impact. The early Stuarts just sort of used Hampton Court for hunting, didn't really change the building. But then we come to the later Stuarts, William and Mary, and we start to see uh, great changes. Now, we have been hearing quite a bit about William of Orange um, on this trip because, uh, because of his influence in Ireland in particular. So we came to have a Dutch king, uh, essentially because Charles II didn't have any legitimate children. His brother James was a Catholic who was unpopular. And Mary is the eldest daughter of King James, and she's the right religion. She's a Protestant, and she's married to William of Orange. So essentially, the elite decide to get rid of James and bring in William and Mary. Um, and the Bill of Rights is passed in February 1689, which has a profound influence on our constitution. It, the, the, the Parliament are actually saying, 
we're going to choose who we want to be our king and queen. And, and not only that, but we're going to tell them how we want them to rule. So this will have um, a profound influence later on. Um, it will be one of the reasons why we didn't have revolutions in this country, because we actually had a constitutional monarchy since 1689. And the Jacobites, of course, come from King James, the deposed King James. So um, Mary's half-brother is the old pretender, and his son is Bonnie Prince Charlie, whom we may have been hearing about um, when we were on Sky. So I hope that kind of puts things into context for you. So what are William and Mary doing at Hampton Court? Well, they decide, yes, we want to live in this location, it's wonderful, but we don't like this old Gothic uh, palace, so we need to rebuild. And this is what they do. They commission Sir Christopher Wren, and they're looking for something that looks rather like Versailles. It will be beautiful. Um, the architecture will be very Baroque. It will be um, full of symmetry and balance and very classical. Um, and there's also a thinking at this time that classical architecture is associated with liberalism and rationalism, whereas the old Gothic harks back to the medieval Catholic period. So this is very much the in thing. But it will be um, Versailles on a budget. Uh, William doesn't have the sort of money that Louis XIV has. This is a constitutional Protestant monarchy. They also don't want to be too extravagant or too um, showy. However, Sir Christopher Wren um, starts building. And this is what he produces. Um, sadly, in order to do this, beautiful as it is, it also meant that he's pulling down Henry's palace in order to do it. And then inside um, William's apartments, we also have this magnificent interior. And we have the finest craftsmen coming to work for the king. A Jean Tijoux, who did the ironwork at St. Paul's, I mean, he, he does this beautiful uh, staircase for King William. Antonio Verrio does the wall painting. Louis Laguerre uh, works at Hampton Court. So does Grinland Gibbons. All, the, all these great craftsmen come and work for the king. And what's the point of all this? Just like Henry, he needs to impress any visiting ambassador. The ambassadors are our best primary source because they're constantly writing home about what they see at court. And, and why is it important for a king to impress an ambassador? Because they write home about magnificent gardens and palaces and, and what looks like affluence. And a nation who can afford to spend a lot of money on this sort of thing is also a nation who can equip an army or build a navy. So it... it it's really as simple as that. Okay. And then outside, we have these lovely gardens. Um, Henry had pond gardens here because the Tudors need to eat a lot of fish. And um, he wanted fresh fish. So, but William and Mary, they, they don't need all that fish. So they dig up the, gar uh, the ponds and turn them into gardens, which you can see here. And the little house in the distance is a little banqueting house, which is actually an intimate space where you can retire to, uh, if you're lucky, uh, with the king. He may invite you to retire there after the main event for some very expensive drinks. Uh, and the most expensive drink in 1700 won't be champagne, it will be a cup of tea. That would be the, 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 the height of luxury at the time. You might go there with the king. This is another view of the pond gardens, and it gives you um, a clear indication of where the Baroque palace joins on to the Tudor, because they ran out of money. They couldn't complete the whole scheme. So that's why we're left with two palaces uh, in one. And you can just about see here where these windows have been blocked up. Now that's because Christopher Wren couldn't complete his vision, his project. But it is, it, there is a reference to William III here because you, you hear guides talking about windows being blocked up um, in London and you can still see um, historic houses with their windows blocked. And it's true that there was a window tax, and it was actually introduced by William of Orange, because William was constantly at war with Louis XIV, constantly short of money, constantly looking for new ways to raise taxes. And one of the ways was the window tax. And people resented it. And even though they could afford it, they, on principle, 
they would block up their windows. And they called it daylight robbery. And that, that is where the term comes from. It's from the hated uh, window tax. Looking out onto the parter, now Henry would have arrived at Hampton Court by river. The river Thames is just here. And he would have landed, coming down by Royal Barge from London, landed here and made his way up through his privy garden. And this whole garden would be full of the coloured beasts, like the yales and dragons and lions, um, you know, really quite impressive. And that's how he'd make his way up to the palace. But what we're looking at here is the privy garden of William of Orange, exactly as it would have looked in 1702. It's a parterre designed to be viewed from above, the height of fashion in 1700. And it's all about the king controlling nature with tightly clipped hedging, statues and fountains. Now, we recreated that garden in 1995, and when we came to recreate it, we had excellent records on how the garden should look. So I can tell you that, that this is exactly how it looked in 1702. And one of the reasons that we had these good records is the circumstances of King William's death. Excuse me. Um, William died very suddenly in 1702. He was out hunting and his horse stumbled on a molehill. The king was thrown from his horse, he broke his collarbone, and he died later at Kensington Palace. Um, and because a mole was responsible for the king's death, um, ever after, the Jacobites would raise their glasses to the wee gentleman in black velvet. And the, all the craftsmen who'd been working for the king um, Louis Le Gour, Antonio Vario, Grinland Gibbons, Jean Tijoux, the gardeners, George London and Henry Wise, they hadn't quite finished what they were doing. And on hearing news of the king's death, they all rushed to do one thing. They hand in their invoices and detailed records of everything that they'd been doing. And they were worried that they would never be paid. And they were right to be concerned. Queen Anne came to the throne and she was very slow to pay. Years after his death, Jean Tijoux's family were still, you see these beautiful screens at the bottom of the garden, his family was still petitioning the crown for payment for the work that he'd done on these screens. But the good, the good part of it is that it did leave us with these excellent records. So then, so Queen Anne comes to the throne, she, her, all her children die, um, and then she is the last of her line because she doesn't leave the crown to her exiled half-brother, the, um, the Jacobites. And we, then we have the Hanoverians coming in. I'm going to skip over George I and go straight to George II and Queen Caroline because... They had an impact at Hampton Court Palace. They were the last king and queen um, to live at Hampton Court, and they made changes to the, the structure of the palace. And they're quite an interesting couple. She was uh, very intelligent, um, very attractive, um, far more astute and politically capable than, than her husband, but she was clever enough to let George think that, that he was in charge. Um, George had mistresses because it was um, expected that a king at this time should have a mistress. It was almost uh, a political role. But the irony of it was that he was actually in love with his wife. He, he loved Caroline very much. And she died at Hampton Court Palace in 1737. After she died, he left the palace and never went back uh, because it had bad memories because his wife had died there. So they're the last couple to, uh, to live at Hampton Court. But I just want to show you um, what they did. They had some new apartments made for their favorite son, who was the, the Duke of Cumberland, not, not the oldest son, he was a younger son. And what they did was they remodeled Henry's private apartments. This is Clock Court. And the architect they used was William Kent. Now, Kent's known more as a painter, really, than an architect. 
But, and his style was normally Palladian, so he's a classical architect. But Robert Walpole, who incidentally is our first prime minister, he suggested that Kent should uh, try and blend in with the Tudor architecture and do it in the Gothic style. So it's actually a very early example of Gothic revival. And Kent did it so well that you wouldn't know this was Georgian. The only clue is this little badge here which says GR 1732. Now, it did mean that Henry's private rooms, his privy apartments, were, were swept away. But we have got hidden staircases and hidden doors. We have the footprint in here. So um, a guide, a good guide, should be able to show you the layout of Henry's private apartments, even within this, um, this Georgian uh, structure. And then I'm, I'm jumping on now to Queen Victoria because um, she's the next monarch to really have a big impact. And it's because Queen Victoria did something revolutionary. Um, she comes to the throne in 1838 and she opens up Hampton Court Palace to the public. Um, previously, as I've mentioned, the royal family weren't living there, but increasingly uh, grace and favour residents were using the palace talk a little bit more about grace and favour in a minute, but we, ha we did have people living there who were not, not necessarily royalty. And Victoria thought that it would be nice to open the palace to the public. They could come out and visit. And Sundays were very popular days for the Victorians. The railway arrived and people could come out by train, walk in these beautiful gardens and explore the palace. And it was all free as well. And it really captured the Victorian imagination and the palace became even more famous at this time. But more importantly, the Victorians spent a lot of money on Hampton Court. There were two big periods of restoration, the 1840s and the 1870s, and we're incredibly grateful to them for what they've done. Now, think about all of Henry's houses and palaces. I've told you he had more than 50. Where's Greenwich? Where's Whitehall? Whitehall burned down in 1698. Where's Richmond? Bewley. Yeah, there's so many of them. None such. They're gone. We're so lucky to have this palace still in existence. And any of you who like the Tudors, you may have read books, whether it be historical novels or histories, you, you may enjoy reading about the Tudors. If you want to walk in the footsteps of the Tudors, this is the place you need to be. You can walk the great hall, you can walk through the great watching chamber and the galleries where they all were, the six wives, Thomas Moore, Thomas uh, Cromwell, Cranmer, um, the Elizabethans, Essex, Drake and Raleigh. You know, it's right this one place where you can walk in the footsteps of all these people. And the, the Victorians preserved it for us by uh, spending a great deal of money on restoration and preservation. Some of what they did is not quite correct. If we look here at this Victorian photograph of the Great Hall, they put the deer heads in the hall, which Henry never did, and they even displayed armour which is a complete Victorian invention. The Tudors didn't use armour as decoration. It, it, was, you know, it was very expensive, and it was for, for warfare. It wasn't a decoration. Anyway, we leave some of what they did because it's now part of our heritage. The Victorians also gave us our ghosts. We have many at Hampton Court. There isn't really any historical evidence, or hardly none, and the ghosts that we have are much more to do with a Victorian fascination with spiritualism and the paranormal. But they're very popular, especially with our young visitors. And the Victorians made our maze very famous. Now, it's not terribly large. Um, it's only about a quarter of a mile. The, the seven-foot um, U used to be um, hornbeam, and it's ironic because the maize was first planted from, for William of Orange, but the hornbeam actually died of Dutch elm disease. So it's now planted in yew in the exact footprint of the original maize. So it dates from about 1690. And um, 350,000 people go in every year. And we hope 
that 350,000 come out again. They, they seem to come out. Um, as I said, it's not very big. It features in a Victorian book called Three Men in a Bolt by Jerome K. Jerome, during which one of the characters says, oh, it's so tiny, it's ridiculous to even call it a maze, only to become so terribly lost that he despaired of ever seeing his friends and family again. So if you do go in, allow yourself at least 20 minutes to, uh, to get out again. I think, it, I think the reason it's so famous is really just because the Victorians loved it so much. Also, the vine um, really captured the public imagination. And it's very important this year because we're celebrating the birth of Capability Brown, the great landscape gardener of the 18th century. Um, it's 300 years since his birth. So Capability Brown actually had a house at Hampton Court. He was royal gardener, but he didn't landscape there because the royal family weren't living there. George III had Buckingham House, which will later become Buckingham Palace, and George didn't like Hampton Court, so he's not going to spend money on the gardens. So Capability Brown is living there, he's working at Kensington and other places, and he, he doesn't do an awful lot, but one thing he does is he plants a little cutting of a grapevine. And he plants it in 1768. It's now the biggest and the oldest in the world. Now, we don't know how long this vine is going to live for. We've no idea. There's a lady who looks after it. She's called the vine keeper, and that's her sole responsibility to take care of this vine. We tried making wine a few years ago, and it was horrible. Can't make wine. But the grapes are lovely. It's a black dessert grape, which we sell in the palace shops. So, again, if you come to Hampton Court, this is, this is one of the highlights to see the vine. Okay, now I want to say a little bit about Grace and Favour because this is really one of the hidden stories of the palace. You know, we, we, we hear plenty about the kings and queens and all the famous residents, but sometimes we don't know that much about the hidden residents. Now, I've explained that the royal family weren't living here after George II and Queen Caroline, and particularly, actually, in the reign of George III, um, we start seeing a lot more people moving in into grace and favour. And the apartments that they move into initially are quite grand because they were built for courtiers and they're rather large. But then as time goes on, the apartments get smaller. And, and that's for a reason, because over the years, people have less and less servants. It reached its height... The, the height of grace and favour, in the late 19th century, when there was about 100 households in grace and favour, and then they would, each of those had their servants as well. Um, now, when I say a grace and favour apartment, I'm not talking about a two-bedroom flat. The average apartment had 15 to 20 rooms, and some had as many as 40, so they could be massive. But later on, especially in the 20th century, when people can no longer afford to have so many servants, then we see the apartments getting smaller, and people want smaller apartments. They have to heat them, they have to maintain them. Living in a palace is not always as glamorous as you might think, because the authorities were slow to introduce um, new Modern, modernization, new technology, uh, bathrooms, even kitchens. Some apartments didn't have kitchens. Electricity, very slow to increase, uh, to introduce that. Lifts, so elevators, and it's not fun if you're an elderly person living on a in a top floor apartment. And many of these residents increasingly were becoming elderly people. So they used to use baskets, and we can see the basket here. If you're on the top floor, you can lower your basket down for your groceries, provisions, milk, post, etc. One old lady even trained her little dog to go down in the basket, and then, and then she could hoist him up again. Um, so, well into the 20th century, some people still didn't have electricity. The residents of a house, which was once lived in by Professor Faraday, Michael Faraday, um, they didn't get electricity till the 1930s. And it's ironic because he pioneered electromagnetic induction. 
Um, but one of my favourite um, stories, which I think is, is, is a really good example, was an old lady called Miss Millicent Gordon. Now, she moved into the palace in the 1840s as a baby. And she lived in the palace for more than 100 years. In 1941, her housekeeper wrote to the Lord Chamberlain and petitioned for a bathroom for this old lady. Despite her great age, the petition was turned down and she died in 1949 at the age of 105 in a grace and favour apartment that had no bathroom. So it wasn't always um, the height of luxury. On the right, we can see some Edwardian Grace and Favour residents up on the rooftops at Hampton Court. And we, we do, still do roof tours today, which is a spectacular way of seeing the palace and gardens. So really, the best way to um, think of Hampton Court Palace is to think of it as two palaces in one. The, the rose red brick of uh, Henry VIII, the Gothic that we can see, the Gothic architecture, which is all about spires and towers and flying buttresses and uh, pointed arches. And, and it's alongside this Baroque architecture, which is all about perfect balance and symmetry, two very different architectures side by side. And here is the great hall that I showed you earlier, which Henry built, which was completed in 1536. And then we can see some of the wonderful gardens surrounding the palace. So as I mentioned right at the beginning, um, it, it, it's a palace for royal residents, a magnificent venue, a venue for pleasure, a venue, a place to impress. Um, but dig a little deeper and you'll find other hidden stories like the story of grace and favour. If anyone would like any more information or has have any questions at all, please do come up and ask me. I hope that I've inspired some of you to come back and visit us and that this lecture will have given you a nice little introduction and overview prior to your visit. Thank you very much. Thank you.